And I'm very, very pleased to have with me on the call, live and in color, Governor Howard Dean. Governor, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, and I'm sorry I didn't wear a tie. If I'd known you were going to get so dressed up, I would have. You know what? I just put it up 10 minutes ago, and I thought, <laughs> it's the classic. It's the classic. The last time I, I, I dropped it. <laughs> um, yeah, great having you here. Um, I'll just do a very, very brief intro, and then I'll, I'll leave it to you and turn over to you. Because um, many people will know you, but, but uh, still... The, the, the classical introduction. So you've been- well, don't get, I already heard the classical introduction, didn't they? Um, kind of, to the, to the format. I'll just oh. switch. I'll just, okay. just make it very brief that you, I mean, you, you were in politics for 30 years. You were a six time elected governor. Um, the start into that was special. We may get into that or, or we may not, but you were re-elected five times. You started off as lieutenant governor. You were a member of the House of uh, Representatives in Vermont in your, your state. And then you were uh, chair of the Democratic National Convention, which doesn't exist in Germany, that, uh, like head of the Democratic Party in that sense, uh, in a German equivalent. And you drafted two um, uh, very, very important things for the Democratic Party. On the one hand, you were a, a, an online pioneer. Um, you started um, the, all that infrastructure that, that later made, I think it's fair to say that, that helped making uh, President Barack Obama having a successful bid. And you also drafted the 50 states strategy, meaning in a nutshell that um, every state was to be targeted, um, also swing states were to be targeted and so on. So um, extensive political career. Then you went into the private sector. You're, you're a part-time consultant. Um, you still are active in politics um, in, in, um, on the board of the um, National Democratic Institute and, and others. And in 2017, we were very honored, very blessed to have you as a live speaker in Düsseldorf in North Rhine Westphalia. At the time, you talked about globalization, and of course, uh, Corona wasn't around the wasn't around the corner, and and other things weren't. Now we live in a different world, and uh, yeah, very honored to have you back here in a virtual sense and to listen to your expertise. So, welcome, Governor Howard Dean. Thank you very much. I apologize for all the technical problems here. Um, so let me just make a few um, remarks. Um, first of all, of course, I know that Europeans are horrified, as are most citizens of the world, by our president, uh, or I should say the American president. He certainly isn't my president. Um, and I want you to keep something in mind as we go through this discussion. Donald Trump was elected by a minority in the very peculiar system that we have. Um, Trump is not an, an aberration. Uh, you have uh, PIS in Poland. You have uh, Orban. Uh, you have uh, the uh, prime, Min prime minister of, of uh, or the uh, president of Brazil. Uh, so there are a number of uh, populists who have come to power who are essentially authoritarians in their soul. Uh, that is not uh, America. Uh, the, the, the world has changed dramatically. As, uh, as Chancellor Merkel, Merkel has said, uh, you cannot trust the Americans as a reliable ally anymore. I think that's true, but that will change when Trump leaves office. Obviously, I'm very hopeful that Trump will leave office in January as a result of the November elections. Uh, but we are undergoing a very difficult time in the United States of America. It is true that for 100 years, we were the beacon of democracy. Our democracy is under attack, and it's under attack by our own people. Um, and really, I've, been, I've thought of this uh, in, sort of in a great many terms over the past uh, three and a half years. Uh, and really, unfortunately, this is a reflection of, of who we are as a species. Uh, we, we, are, we can construct grand things like the Constitution of the United States or the European Union. Uh, but what those attempts are really is to wall off the incredibly destructive sides of us as, as human beings, which uh, are unbounded by uh, civilized behavior. And uh, that is our, has been our fate in the United States uh, after uh, really uh, a century of American dominance. My own view is the American dominance is gone. Uh, we, of course, are still the largest economy in the world. And uh, so we will not be a, a small uh, power unless things get much, much worse, uh, which they could if Trump is reelected. Um, but uh, this is an interesting uh, phenomenon because in essence, Trump, although he's, first of all, he is uh, clinically insane, I think. 
Uh, but one of his problems is that he has a, an unbounded insecurity about himself, and he's terribly uh, jealous of Barack Obama. And one of the most interesting things about that is Obama actually had a foreign policy where his envision, his vision was that the United States would no longer be the, quote, the indispensable nation. He didn't ever said it this way, but what he said was that we needed a multipolar alliances where individual countries would take leadership on particular issues and then we would form alliances. We were very unsuccessful in getting the Europeans to do that because for 70 years, the Europeans had been conditioned after World War II to respond to the United States, to take direction from the United States. Well, I, interestingly enough, for all Trump's destruction and craziness, he has actually uh, embodied one of the most important things uh, that was in Obama's foreign policy, which was we were no longer the indispensable nation. Uh, as Chancellor Merkel uh, said, uh, that uh, the world is learning to get along without the United States, uh, leaving the Paris Accord he has completely abdicating, abdicated American leadership. There are some upsides to this. Uh, the first of, of, is that we must get through this. We must, uh, find, we must oppose populism. We must try to find, figure out what the sources are that have caused populism. And we do not need to be nice about that. Politics is, uh, as Clausewitz once said, Cla uh, politics is nothing but uh, war by another means. And we can never forget that. Uh, war is about uh, asset allocation and succession. Politics is about asset allocation and succession. So we are in a war right now, and we're in a war with ourselves as a species uh, all over the world. Uh, this is going on. I do not believe that, that the human, humankind has a future as an authoritarian uh, species. Uh, I, do, I, I think we will kill our own planet. Uh, and so that's what the war is, really the survival of the species. And we, we have to be much tougher than we have been, but we can never stoop to the level of the authoritarians uh, because that's what gets us in trouble uh, in the first place. Uh, I, I remain uh, optimistic. Uh, I do believe that uh, in the long run, if we work hard enough and if we are firm enough in our convictions and, and our, in our uh, ability and willingness to limit the excesses of authoritarianism, uh, that we can succeed. Uh, but history is full of uh, uh, countries that have not succeeded, and I, I hope ours will not be added to uh, that list. Uh, there is a there is something else going on in the United States which you may or may not be aware of, and I don't know if it's going on in Germany or not. What's happening in the United States is young people are taking over the political process, and they are almost all voting for the Democrats. Sixty nine percent of them vote for the Democrats. Uh, the Democrats are not perfect by a long uh, shot. Uh, but we fundamentally do believe in democracy. We believe in the, uh, we have an optimistic vision for the future of humankind. Um, and that is where these young people are drawn. And young people have now taken over most of the party. The Democratic Party is, is uh, very wide. Uh, it would be uh, possibly the, uh, it, would it would certainly be the, the, uh, the SPD, and it would probably even be the, Christian, the old Christian Democrats in Germany. Yeah, totally uh, different spectrum. Yeah, yeah, I it's agree. A different spectrum. <laughs> uh, and and there are the, the left is actually not where the Democratic Party is going. It's not moving further left. It's moving towards the center. That is, if, if you look at who was elected in the 2018 congressional elections, you find that 30 uh, that there were 40 new Congress people, uh, and that five of them were very very left. And that's of course what the press writes about. Uh, but 35 of them were, had served in the military. They're moderate people. They come from Texas and Oklahoma and very conservative parts of California and Pennsylvania. And they're moderate, thoughtful people. And that's really the future of our party. Our young people are committed to a world where uh, global warming is, and climate change are beaten back and controlled. Our people are committed to a world of diversity. Uh, they, are, they elected Barack Obama. It's the only election, American election in my lifetime where more people under 35 voted than over 65. Uh, what that means is that there's a whole generation of, that don't think anything like the Trump people. Uh, they are very diverse. If you look at the pictures uh, of the Virginia legislature in 2017, the, the freshman class, and the freshman class of the Congress in 2018, they're much darker, they're much more female, and they're much younger. And that's the future of our country. And that's, a, that's the future of the world, as, as, as your own chancellor, who I admire greatly, as you can tell, uh, as your own chancellor has said. 
Um, it, yes, these things will be very difficult. Uh, yes, there will be a lot of work. Yes, we have to overcome our own prejudices and our own feelings about these things. But there is no future unless we can succeed in a diverse world. And the young people in this country know that. So I'm an optimist. I, I think by far the vast majority of Americans uh, believe uh, in a global world. Uh, there is no option really in a global world. I do think coronavirus is going to have an interesting effect. I think it will shorten supply chains. So I think some jobs will come back uh, to industrial Europe and to uh, industri industrial United States, despite the wage difference, simply because one of the lessons of coronavirus is that uh, if your supply chains are so complicated and so difficult, then you run a risk uh, that you, you may not have the cheapest product, but you may, may not have any product at all. Uh, and so you will see some adjustments. Uh, and the most fascinating thing, which I hope we can spend a little bit of time, is what the long-term adjustments of coronavirus is. Oh, we yeah. will get through coronavirus. There will be a vaccine. I, I, you know, it may be developed in Germany or the UK or Switzerland or the United States, but there'll be a vaccine. Um, and there will be a, a lot of uh, deaths, uh, especially of people my age, unfortunately, and hoping not to be one of them. Um, Me too. <laughs> uh, so, but, uh, but. As a result of this, the world will change dramatically. What's gonna happen in commercial real estate where my, uh, con my uh, clients as consultants have already discovered they only need half the office space they've been having for all this time. Oh yeah, big topic as well. Yeah. Yeah. And what's gonna happen in the universities where the university I teach at at Yale may not open uh, except in, uh, online. Uh, so there are many, many changes coming uh, as a result of this, I think most thoughtful thinking people on both sides of the Atlantic understand that we have to make these changes together, and we are not going back to the world of Donald Trump and Steve Bannon, who really are a very destructive people, and destructive people eventually destroy themselves, and it's our job not to make sure they destroy all of us, and we're not going to let them do it. Yeah, thank you very much, Governor. Uh, let's, let's, let's jump in right there, and um, I can just reiterate, um, uh, all of you out there, you can uh, ask questions. I've, of course, prepared questions, and I'll, I'll uh, directly follow up with what has been said. But uh, please click on the button down there, um, on the uh, raise your hand button or on the Q&A button. I'll incorporate. Yeah, following up, uh, Governor, to what you, what you just said, um, um, that, that you are, of course, hoping for a change in policies after November 3rd. Now, uh, the president's uh, approval ratings are historically low, depending on the poll stations. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, polling is a difficult, a difficult topic because the polls were different in 2016 as well. But um, last week, we had another speaker from the uh, Republican Party, uh, Ron Nearing. He was the communications director for uh, Ted Cruz running for office back in those days. And he said that the coronavirus is the topic for this, uh, for this election. He said no other topic is defining whatever happens with coronavirus a crisis management will be will be determining for the outcome of the election. So I take it that you don't agree, or I heard that you don't agree. You, um, which other factors um, are accounting from from your perspective? Well, coronavirus, I think, is a stand-in for uh, for uh, Trump. That is, um, every re-election for a president is really a referendum on the president. Uh, people are upset because Biden is not campaigning because he can't because of the. Uh, epidemic and so pandemic and so forth, but this is this is a, you know Trump and Trump ha does have a narcissistic psychiatric disorder and I think one of the things uh, uh, that is a part of that is he must be in the center of attention at all times. So I actually would have some disagreements. It is true that coronavirus will bring out people's characters, but what this election is really about is Trump. Period. Uh, Trump wants it that way, or his 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 uh, id wants it that way, uh, and um, that's what it's going to be about. So the coronavirus, or whether it's the economy and w whatever it is, uh, is is going to be the issue. And do you want Donald Trump as president of the president of the United States again? Mm -hmm. uh, all but his and his his followers are are very cult like and 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 not terribly well educated, um, but. Uh, there are a lot of thoughtful people in the middle who would like more conservative politics and are, so far have been willing to overlook the corruption. This president is the most corrupt president in the history of the United States. And there have been plenty of corrupt presidents in the history of the United States. 
Uh, so this election will not be about coronavirus. Coronavirus will be a stand-in for leadership or lack of leadership, and that's what the election is really about. Um, yeah, uh, switching from, from President Trump, I mean, which is hard because he is so omnipresent at the moment, uh, switching to the Democratic competitor, um, I think uh, we, we all agree that it's going to be Joe Biden. And um, now in some uh, polls, he seems to be pulling ahead and his campaign manager, I'm quoting this, I'm reading this now, he just recently said, if we keep these numbers um, uh, from the beginning, uh, from the moment, and we keep them through in November, that would put us in uh, uh, at 318 electoral votes. That is more than 270 that's needed and that would be a landslide. Now, is this just campaign rhetoric or also, do you also see like, like, a, like a, a feeling of change in the country at the, uh, at the moment? Uh, that's a very good question. And so, I, and I don't know exactly what the answer is. I suspect, well, I know he's right, of course, because I've seen the polls too. I, I'm not sure I would have said that because I'm more conservative. It's very about, concrete, yeah. yeah. <laughs> very, very optimistic. But the interesting thing here is that I believe that, I thought Bernie Sanders was going to be our nominee. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was chosen, all of a sudden everything changed. And he was chosen because the public is tired of the drama and uh, they're tired of uh, fl high flying rhetoric. What they'd like is a break. And Trump is nothing but drama, of course. And Sanders is pretty much drama too. He's a much more substantive person than Trump, uh, but he has very strong beliefs. And, and, uh, and I think that at some point people made the switch. They, they, they look, we've got coronavirus, we've tr got Trump who's crazy. We, we, we don't need another a social crusader. And that's, so th that's what they're looking for at this moment. So uh, I would agree that if the numbers today hold up, uh, we'll win and we'll, we, I, you know, I don't like the word landslide because I, I, I've lived through two landslides where the president won 49 uh, states out of 50. That's a landslide, 318 mm -hmm. votes, I don't, electoral votes, I don't consider to be a landslide. Um, but uh, yes, if the numbers hold up, we'll win. Uh, but this is six months out or five and a half months out. Uh, and yeah. There's no guarantee these numbers are going to hold up. And we have a long, long, long way to go. Let's talk a bit about Vice President Biden. Um, now you're, you're, um, you know Garrett Bass, who he moderated the discussion three years ago. Oh. And he just wrote, hello, Mr. Bass. Uh, he just wrote a question and I'm going to read it out. Um, he, he's writing, um, is Joe Biden really a convincing alternative? Um, he, um, a, 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 an alternative meaning, for example, younger or no establishment. I mean, he's none of these. Um, I'm worried that he fails like Hillary. Does he represent sufficiently the democratic America, which really wants a change? Well, and, well, actually, I think the Democratic America would like at this point to go back to the old way of doing things and be very grateful for it. Um, you know, I think they tried that we want to change with Trump and look what they got. Uh, so, um, I, look, Biden is a known quantity. He's been doing this for 40 years. His roots are in the working class people who normally had voted for Democrats and switched over to Trump because they'd given up on politics as usual, which the Democratic Party seemed to represent. Um, so, and he has said, I think he's been quite frank about what he intends to do. He's a transitional president. If Trump wins, we'll have the first woman elected in either of the two senior positions uh, in the world. We don't know who it's going to, I mean, in the United States, we don't know who it's going to be yet, but, um, can you give a guess? What, what, who, who's your favorite? I don't have a guess. There's been 10 names floating around and, and I don't make a guess. They're all good names and I'm not worried about any of them. Um, so the only, the only unusual thing on the ticket, besides the fact that we're, the, the Republicans are running somebody who's crazy, is that uh, we'll have a woman, a pro and quite possibly a woman of color on the ticket. Uh, and that'll, and, but Biden is predictable. Everybody, look, Biden, people have watched Biden for 40 years. They know what they get. And I think right now there's a sentiment in our country after having a lunatic running the place that we maybe it might, might be so nice to show, slow down a little bit and have some predictability. Yeah, I'm now going to switch uh, to another predictability because someone, someone who I know is raising his hand, uh, it's Andreas Falke. He's um, a uh, professor from Nuremberg and he, he's my colleague in running another America Center, uh, Center America House in Nuremberg. And I'm now going to pass the mic to Andreas who will ask his question to Governor Dean. Hi, Andreas. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Governor Dean. I, I really appreciated your comment uh, that basically the American people don't want to have any drama anymore. 
But my question is, in the primary process, do you think the Democrats did find kind of the ideal candidate? I mean, it's true, Biden is a known quantity, but how is he going to operate under the permanent assault that the Trump campaign and their allies will unleash? Uh, and will then, will that not decide whether Americans will say, well, maybe a social path, but maybe somebody who is not fully up to to the office anymore may not be the right person. I know it's a very critical question, but I think there are certain risks uh, associated uh, with Joe Biden. Well, there were going to be risks no matter who we picked. We could have picked Pete Buttigieg, who was 37 years old. Mm -hmm. I, I was very interested in having a young versus old yeah. dynamic in the race. I was very openly for somebody mm -hmm. much younger. My favorite candidate would have been Chris Murphy, who didn't run. Senator Murphy from yeah. Connecticut. Uh, <laughs> who's an internationalist mm. and a very smart guy. So, but whoever you choose is going to have liabilities. Is, is, I mean, look, we chose the most qualified uh, person that had probably run for president in 50 years the last time, and she didn't win. So, uh, you know, it, it, I, everybody's going to have a weakness. And the assault that's going to come, this is, this is the really the crux of, of where we are and the tr crux of whether democracy survives in the United States or not. This is really not up to so much what we do. Um, this is not a game of chess. This is now a war for the souls of the American people, as Biden himself says. Um, and if the American people want to believe all the crap that Trump puts out and the lies of which he's told about 15,000 in the first three years of documented, then they're going to believe it and they'll be responsible for whatever happens. My guess is there are enough Americans that are smart enough uh, and tired enough of of, a, of this corruption to stop. And Biden is in a very acceptable alternative to that. He's t tested and true. Yes, he's old, older than probably a lot of people would like, but Trump is pretty old himself. Uh, so again, I think it's where the American people are more than which candidate you run. The one thing you can say about Biden is he doesn't have any obvious disqualifying faults. He served as vice president for one of the most popular presidents in history uh, for uh, eight years. He knows what he's doing. Uh, he, he gets along well with Congress, which we haven't seen for a while. Uh, and I, I just think, sure, of course, he's got shortcomings, but I think he's probably a very, very good candidate, especially against Trump. Yeah, um, let's let's jump to November 3rd or maybe after the November 3rd. We have another um, very interesting question here from uh, Dr. Philip Adolf uh, from the University of Bonn, who's asking, do you think there is a serious potential of the election winding up in the courts due to COVID-19 related things? Uh, I don't know, primaries being changed or whatever, whatever you think of. Is that a possibility that we, we have this in courts again or at the Supreme Court? Uh, yes, it certainly is. Uh, you, you cannot move the day of the election. That's in the Constitution of the United States. So you'd have to have a constitutional amendment, which is as impossible as anything is impossible in a democracy in six months. Um, you could certainly have a recount in the, the kind of Bush versus Gore kind of thing. Yeah. I think um, it, it'll be interesting. The swing vote is Roberts. Roberts is a, he's a right wing ideologue, but he's a smart guy. The other four, are, you know, I don't think worth mentioning in terms of their intellect. Um, and the, but but um, Justice uh, Stevens, who was a Republican, when he retired, uh, he or when excuse me, when they wrote the Bush versus Gore decisions, he cautioned against it, and that really was the beginning of the delegitimization of the Supreme Court in the United States, because they, on a partisan five to four vote, picked the president, which they had no right to do. I think Gore had some capability, culpability because there's a congressional process that he should have then gone on to, but he thought that the country had had enough and wanted, wanted a solution. Um, I don't know that Roberts would be, I mean, the court's in trouble already. About 63% of people under 35 thinks the court co cares only about politics, not about the law. That's incredibly dangerous in a democracy. In fact, it's the end of the rule of law in terms of people's respect for the court. Uh, and I think that I would hope that Roberts would follow the law um, and understand that the legitimacy of not only the court, but the survival of the nation would depend on the court not picking the president, but letting voters pick the president. But, you know, this is a very difficult time in the United States. And every nation reaches a time like this where the country could come un undone. Uh, if Trump wins again, I think the country will come undone. I think it may split up. 
uh, people will leave, investment will go away. Uh, so this is a this is I don't want to underestimate uh, how how dangerous and how incompetent Trump is. Fortunately, he is incompetent because if he were competent and this crazy, we'd really be in trouble. Yeah, switching on to transatlantic harsh harsh statements. Uh, switching on to transatlantic relations, which we are already touching upon now. Um, actually, yesterday, um, the German paper Die Zeit uh, published um, a finding, a poll finding by the German Körber Foundation, where people's uh, German people's attitudes toward the United States were were, were questioned. And um, this was a comparative study: what people thought in Germany thought of the United States, and what people thought of China. Now switching to China. Um, in, in, in this uh, investigation or in this poll, it was actually shown that, that people see the U.S. very unfavorably at the moment. Um, it's no surprise because this has happened uh, during the Iraq war time as well. But what's new is that China is emerging as, as an actor. And one third of people being, being asked uh, now think that uh, Germany should work more closely together with uh, the U.S. And another third thinks that it should favor China. So uh, what do you think of that? I mean, uh, that's a new actor emerging and, 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 and a power vacancy will be used, right? Well, the, um, the, of course, it's a, it doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, China is the second largest economy in the world. So, of course, you have to work closely with China. Working with China is not the same as the relationship with the United States and Germany. Trump is an aberration. Um, I mean, Trump is not the typical American president. Uh, so, I suspect that the relationship between Germany and the United States and between many countries, uh, democracies in the United States will improve dramatically once Trump is gone. You, of course, you have to work with China. They're a powerful economic uh, country. Uh, I, I suspect most Germans who are quite well educated understand very well that China is an authoritarian power, that their business ethics are uh, difficult to deal with sometimes, uh, and that uh, they use their businesses to project their power, which in fact, in fairness, the Americans did for a long time as well. Hmm. So uh, it makes sense to, to have the German people want to deal with China. However, the nature of the relationship is going to be very, very different. Hmm. Yeah, uh, m many people at the moment in this discourse feel that people won't see this. Um, I mean, this is also in line with uh, yesterday's announcement by by uh, Chairman Xi to invest two million do uh, um, dollar, uh, two 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 uh, million um, dollar. Uh, Two million dollars <laughs> over the next ten, uh, two years uh, in the global fight against the pandemic. I mean, they are very active in, in Africa and they are getting things done. And we have this discussion as well in Germany. Um, so, so you think that a, a democratic incumbent would would deal with this situation differently? Oh, um, right. Namely, I mean, we you know the Democrats believe in globalism. We we think we're all in this together, whether we like it or not. Uh, and so you work accordingly. If you, if it's very interesting, yes. African governments in particular like Chinese investment. Yeah. Average, China, uh, average Africans are not so, so sure. The Chinese tend to bring their own workers in. They tend to be quite racist when they treat the way they treat African workers. Um, and, uh, you know, if you speak privately with, not so much with an African leadership, with an average African, you'll find that there's a very mixed opinion of the Chinese. And that's going to happen again and again. The Chinese are not a democratic society. Uh, and in, in defense, uh, they came from such chaos and such uh, difficulty that the, the well-educated people in China are willing to cede their political uh, desires to the government in exchange for the kind of prosperity that they have now. That won't be the case forever. Uh, human beings across the world believe uh, that they are entitled to certain freedoms and certain rights, and that's no, those are things that the Chinese government doesn't grant to their own citizens. Uh, and they won't be granting them to anybody else's citizens either if they're allowed to run the place. So I don't th see, think, I think China will be a very powerful economic uh, force. I think it will be the number one force uh, in the world in the coming century, but I don't ever think it'll replace uh, the soft power that the United States was able to gain because of our ethos that appeals to people's idealism rather than people's, um, people's sense of fear. Yeah, talking about soft power, uh, you mentioned the the populist tendencies in other Euro in European countries, namely in Hungary and Poland. Uh, now, President Trump seems to be getting along uh, with uh, with other leaders in in Europe and uh, is talking to them. What would a President Joe Biden uh, or the Democratic line do differently with such authoritarian leaders? 
Well, I think we would try Well, first of all, that's a European problem, not an American problem. Um, uh, I, I, I think we would encourage Europe to be much, much tougher. I mean, for Orban to declare martial, martial law and the Poles to decide their Supreme Court doesn't matter, which is essentially what they've decided. I don't understand how that's compatible with membership in the European Union. Um, and so that's going to have to be a big issue. And it's a big issue for Germany, to be honest, because Germans, uh, German companies make so much money in Russia that they're, they're, they're reluctant to call Putin on his authoritarianism. Um, so, uh, you know, these are very, very difficult times for the EU. And one of the things, I, in some ways, Trump's election is pushing the EU to decide whether it really wants to be an EU or doesn't. Um, because we're not there to cover for the difficulties that uh, have a, always will arise when you're trying to deal with. I mean, the, the, the great reason that I'm a huge supporter of the European Union is because on the most violent continent on earth for a thousand years, the European Union has, is, is dedicated to extinguishing nationalism and religion as a source of war, which has been the source of war for a thousand years until 1948, seven or yeah. six. Um, so, um, you know, I think Europeans have to run that. And, and I, I think the, the Americans should be helpful, but I think we should take our lead from Europe and how to run the European Union. But I also think that we need to be very firm and firmly allied with democracies in Europe of all sorts against both corruption uh, and authoritarianism, which are, I think are the kinds of negative means of control that will mean the end of our species as human beings. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, uh, harsh words again, uh, but 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 um, I mean, global warming is approaching, and uh, um, that's another question from the audience from uh, Mr. Jürgen Laupold. Um, he asks specifically about global warming, and uh, and he's asking whether this, in your assessment, wouldn't be the even bigger topic than COVID. I mean, COVID will go away next year or the year after, and then uh, then what about global warming? Uh, do we know what what uh, a potential President Biden thinks about this. Oh, this, sure. uh, yeah. oh, yeah. Obama. Well, you know, Obama was largely responsible for getting China to sign the, uh, the Paris Agreement. And then, of course, Trump came along and tried to blow it up. And it hasn't blown up. And that, I think the Europeans can take a lot of credit for that. In the, in the vacuum of leadership that, that Trump uh, has created, Europeans have stepped up uh, and are really the leading advocates for uh, anti-climate uh, change uh, legislation. And I think that's, I mean, you know, pro, uh, I shouldn't say anti-global anti warming uh, legislation, and you are setting the example. Uh, in fact, the truth is that Europe has set the example uh, and been ahead of America for about 15 years on uh, labor regulation, on consumer protection, on privacy protections uh, in many areas and environmental laws as well. So, I mean, I think that one of the things that may happen, that I'm hoping will happen, as, as a, an economy of 550 million people, um, you should be the second largest power, economic power in the world. And I think you will be once you can figure out how to do that, with that and, and properly balance the sovereignty issues, which are always going to be, oh, yeah. uh, be difficult. Um, so I look to Europe for a lot of the leadership that we've had, uh, and global warming is probably the number one problem, and everybody's going to have to deal with it. I mean, as you well know, the pollution in Russia has for a long time been a terrible, terrible problem, and it's getting worse. The average life expectancy of men in Russia is below 60 years old. That's pretty shocking. Hmm. Yeah, talking about Russia, uh, do you, uh, what's your take on the Democratic Party's take on, on potential Russian interference in this election? Um, uh, have precautions been, been met by the, the DNC and what's the current, current uh, precautions and how do you deal with that? Because people are expecting this actually. Uh, there will be attempts. The Russians have already attempted to interfere with the election. Um, the most uh, difficult way that Russians interfere with American elections is actually not hacking. Uh, it is uh, propaganda. It's propaganda. And this is where I think, uh, this, I, know, I admire the Europeans greatly uh, in this area too. The tech industry in America, which was uh, glorified for so very, very long, has turned out to be one of our great weak points in a democracy. Facebook is in this for money and nothing else. Google is in this for money and nothing else. Um, would you like to see my grandchild here? She just came in. Oh, oh. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello there. You're live and on camera. <laughs> yeah, in Germany. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Lovely meeting her. <laughs> uh, yes. 
So, um, so uh, the, the, it, the interesting problem for us is that the Russians, and actually Trump does this too, they will go on and they will pick out their audience very scientifically and aim propaganda at them that makes them mad. And this happens, of course, in Europe as well. As you know very well, the, uh, uh, the uh, AFD does, oh, yeah. AFD does this sort of thing. And they will say all kinds of things that aren't true, but they will weave a narrative that uh, about the Biden, this Hunter Biden stuff that Trump is doing. That, the Russians, that's right out of the Russians' playbook. I actually think eventually, if we, if we survive this, Trump may well be the first ex-president to go to jail. Uh, for Do you think so? Do you really yeah. think so? I think for, because, well, he, look, Trump has been a crook for 35 years. This is not anything new. He was, he was bankrupted five times in the hotel business and he cheated many people. His biggest victim actually was Deutsche Bank. Um, and who's still lending him money, I think, because they don't dare not to. So um, this is the tangled web, but the propaganda uh, that his campaign is putting out really is very much like Soviet, old style Soviet propaganda. That's how the Russians will interfere. The Chinese are trying to interfere too, but they're not very good at it uh, because the cultural differences are so great. But the Russians have figured this out and the KGB has been doing this for 70 or 80 years or the Cold War. Hmm. Uh, uh, and we, we absolutely are getting Russian interference already, uh, and there'll eventually be a penalty to pay uh, for that, either for us or for them. Yeah, the Ukrainian topic, I mean, that's been dis disproven several times, but it still right. sticks somehow and it will be exploited. Yeah, well, what about sticks, the... It yeah. sticks to his cult, and most people, I think, don't believe it. Yeah, yeah, it's still, it's that, that, that Latin saying of anything always sticks, and uh, it, it, right. it, it's, it's, it's staying there. Um, uh, now, uh, we have another question now from uh, Arno Friedrich, uh, who I think is a journalist. Uh, he was asking, um, Governor Diem, what's your opinion on Germany's contribution to NATO, enough or little? I mean, that's a favorite topic also by, by President Obama. I mean, they all right. raised it. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, what's your take on that? And how would, how would Biden change settings on the American presence in Germany? Or would he do anything on that? Well, I do think that um, Europe has been able to minimize its defense expenditures because of the United States. Uh, in some ways, this is, a, this is a subject for Europeans to deal with. Um, and it's not a surprise, surprising that the, the Baltics and the Eastern European nations, minus Orban, who's probably Trump to Putin as well as, you know, the same, same, same <laughs> as Trump is to Putin. Um, but, uh, but this in some ways will be dealt with by the Europeans because the, America will not have the same military umbrella that it had before Trump. Um, and so the Europeans will have to decide what kind of defense they need. And, you know, the, Germany has a longstanding business relationship with, with Russia, which has two effects. One is it means that you're less willing to confront them, but it also means you're not as afraid of them uh, as some of the other countries are, especially the Baltics, which were, of course, were occupied by the Germans for 40 years. Um, so they'll, that'll be a discussion that Europeans have to deal with. Um, you know, there's lots of problems that the Europeans have to deal with. I don't know what I would do with Italy um, because, you know, they have a lifestyle that depends on debt and, and that's anathema to Germans. And, and you know, it, it's, 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 you, those kinds of unions are very, very hard to work out. They're really important. And I think people who denigrate the European Union are making a terrible, terrible mistake. Um, but these are very difficult issues and that's how mistakes get made. Yep. Totally agree with you. It's still a tacky topic in, in, in Europe, right. of course, defending the values of the union. Um, let's talk about uh, a bit about what you, what you said in, in the beginning, uh, a post-corona world and what's going to stick. What's going to stick? Um, um, uh, just as a friendly reminder, we are getting great questions from everyone. Thank you so much out there. If you want to jump on the boat, um, we, we have another, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. Uh, please raise your hands virtually. There's a bu button down there. Um, click on it. Or if you want to write, you can also write. Um, now, um, coming back to campaigning and the presidential election and so on, um, I, I mentioned this initially. You, you are an online pioneer when it comes to politics and fundraising and organizing 
organizational stuff. Um, now, at the beginning, of course, all campaigning is solemnly online because large gatherings, large races are not possible anymore. Do you think, um, I mean, this also has effects on, on, on targeting people, of course. Uh, I mean, you can't knock on their doors and you, you don't know who you are targeting uh, when, when you knock on their doors. Um, uh, will this change campaigning for good? I mean, do you think that campaigning in four years will look totally different because of the crisis? No. Um, I think that the person-to-person -person interaction with voters is so important. It certainly is going to be different this campaign, yeah. obviously, because coronavirus is still going to be a problem in November. But um, it will not, I, I think we'll go back to door-to-door -door campaigning. You just can't, you cannot do politics without having person interaction. You just can't effectively do politics on television. You have to have people touching other people and listening to other people and to succeed in politics. I mean, I actually think that if, if there were more sort of door to door in a place like Germany, there'd be less IF day in Germany. Mm. Um, you know, most, most of the people that vote for Trump or for parties like the IF day are not, you know, horrible people. There are people who are worried and they're concerned and they, and they listen to these inflammatory things and nobody else talks to them. We need to talk to those people and integrate them into society. Yes, there are the evils like people like Steve Bannon, or I'm sure you have a German equivalent. Uh, those you're not yeah, going to do. Them. <laughs> they're just full of hate and they don't really have much interest in other people. But the average person who works for a living uh, just wants some reassurance that his world isn't, or her world isn't going to be turned upside down by forces they don't understand. And I, I'm not saying, oh, we should do whatever they want or we should agree with them. But I am saying we need to listen to each other. And door-to-door -door campaigning is a very effective way of doing that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And I, I, I think uh, people will, will return to that. Uh, I mean, this must also have an effect on budgeting, of course, at the beginning, uh, at the moment. Um, I mean, all these uh, large donor uh, uh, dinner meetings uh, are not happening. at the. What, what's happening behind doors at the moment? Do you know that? Do, do they still donate uh, without the dinner? Or uh, how does yeah, that work? Biggest, yeah, sure they donate without the dinner. The biggest problem in America is we basically made corruption legal. I was once in Ukraine when Yanukovych was president. And I was talking to his chief of staff. It was actually, I think Yanukovych had a quota for one honest person in the entire regime, and she was it. She was a professor of economics from one of the universities. She's very, very smart and spoke very, very good English. So I'm, we were talking about this, and I'm, we're talking about the Russians and all this. And I said, well, Madam Chief of Staff, one of the problems is you can't have oligarchs running your political parties. And then I said, oh, wait a minute, I can't give you this part of my lecture because oligarchs now are legally running political parties in the United States. <laughs> uh, I mean, that was the worst political decision since uh, this era of slavery, uh, when the court decided that money was speech. It's not, uh, corporations are not people. You're this talking about the super, in, super PACs thing, right? Uh, yeah, this court was put in place to undermine American democracy by people who have a lot of money. That's what happened. And the Federalist Society, who has put them in place, also takes huge un, un, unrecorded donations. So that has to be changed. One of the things we're gonna to have to do is change the Supreme Court. And I don't know how we're gonna do it exactly. This court is illegitimate in my view uh, and in the view of many Americans. It's very dangerous and they don't serve the American people and they don't follow the law. So that's gonna be a major, major surgery that we're gonna to have to do. And I don't know exactly know how we're gonna do it. <laughs> that was my that question, of course, because that's- By the way, the Biden will resist. Uh, pardon, I, I didn't get it. Okay, that there. is something that Biden will resist because he's an institutionalist, but that institution is broken. The Supreme Court of the United States is a broken institution. I mean, that's, of course, one of the pillars of the whole system. And that's hard, that's right. hard, to, hard to shackle. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> follow-up question by our listener, Carol Habich Traut. Thank you very much for that. How do we get money out of politics? I think that's uh, maybe a rhetoric question. I mean, yeah, that's hard. Yeah. You have to undo Citizens United. There's no reason for that. There, was, there were both conservatives and liberal states that banned uh, private money from politics, Arizona and Maine, and the courts threw all that out too. This is a court that is not, have, does not have the best interest of the United States or the Constitution at heart. They're put there for political reasons, and that has to be changed. Hmm. Yeah, what else could we talk about? Oh, of course, uh, polarization. I mean, um, uh, that's so increasing at the uh, at the moment. And um, I mean, President Barack Obama made 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 a, an unusual move at his commencement speech recently when he um, kind of directly uh, criticized the current leadership. Do you think that was a clever political move? 
I think it was a necessary political move. I think uh, one of the problems with, with the Washington establishment, especially the Republican Party, is they have no idea how to deal with Trump. I mean, I, the idea that all but Mitt Romney would vote against impeaching the president is just stunning. And, and when Nixon was impeached, the Republicans were saying, were, were the ones that went to tell him he had to resign or he'd be removed. So the Republicans, they're so terrified of Trump because he's, he, you know, he controls most of the voters in the Republican primaries. Several of them have lost their jobs who did stand up for them, so nobody else will stand up to him. Uh, when you it, think I mean, that's a really a major problem. When you think that's going to change, let's, let's uh, just for a moment assume you won the election. Will that stay on for four more years or even more uh, with a potential successor? Or when, when, uh, when can the party find a new way in, in that sense? The well, Republic? they can't. Um, the problem is, you know, as I said, our party is, uh, is more of color, more female and much younger. Their party is really old, white and not very well educated. Uh, and the problem is, you know, As they say in biology, our telomeres are not getting longer, they're getting shorter. So his party is going to get older and older. And I think there's going to be an explosion in the Republican Party. They have nothing to, to attract younger voters, and younger voters pretty soon are going to be older voters. Mm -hmm. So um, I, they have a huge job ahead of them. If Trump wins, it'll, the problem with, with Trump winning is it'll postpone the inevitable for the Republican Party, but it may wreck the United States. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you actually saw a secessionist movement in the United States if Trump wins. Mm -hmm. And what about your, your own party? Um, do you see any rising stars who haven't uh, emerged at the, uh, at the moment? Or um, um, do you think that, that all the names that we've heard so much over the past year are just four, four years um, be before their success? I think there are a lot of rising stars in our party, none of whom you've ever heard of. I mentioned Chris Murphy, Stacey Abrams is another one. Uh, there are a lot of people who have been uh, very heavily involved who are young and have a very different point of view about how you win elections and, and what the country needs. It's an interesting generation, this next generation, this generation of, of Paul who fixed this, uh, fixed my computer. Um, <laughs> they are more conservative about money because they all had to live through 2008. Uh, but they're very what, what we might call liberal about accepting others, uh, women's rights, Uh, very liberal about uh, uh, immigration, uh, about certainly very much concerned about climate change. So it's a new generation uh, that's going to populate the United States and is populating Europe too, too although it's a little bit slower process in, in Europe. Um, and I, I'm very optimistic about that. And I, I think that's what's really going to change. The Republicans have, don't have a bench. I mean, if you think people like Ted Cruz are your bench, He, he, he would get 5% of the vote in, in, uh, in Vermont if he ever ran for anything up here. And he barely survived his election in Texas. <laughs> um, you are an optimist. You said that several times. And uh, now uh, we all know, know this cliche saying that uh, the Chinese sign of, of, of crisis is also a sign of hope and so on and so, on and so forth. So every crisis can, can bring about some, some maybe positive change. Right. Um, do, do, you, do you think that's true with this crisis? Do you think we can, even naively speaking, emerge as something better as a species? Uh, are you talking about the coronavirus crisis? Yeah, I'm talking about the, I'm back to the coronavirus oh, crisis. Oh, yeah, I think there's no question about that. Um, I, think, uh, I think we'll change college education. It'll be very hard. There'll be a lot of universities that go out of business, uh, particularly in the United States. Uh, but the model will change and universities will become less expensive. Um, I think there's going to be less, uh, less commercial construction. I think there'll be more interaction uh, in, uh, electronically. I think there'll be less pollution by the airline industry. I think the airline industry, I don't think they'll ever recover from its load. Why would you, if you're, if you're a German executive, why would you send a top team of people to the United States to a big conference for $50,000 if you could do it like this? Hmm. Um, you wouldn't. And if you're an American executive, you're not going to send them to either to Germany or to Los Angeles and spend all that kind of money uh, if you can do this. Now, it's, this is not going to replace in person. No, I was, I was about to say, I mean, the, the whole networking and the whole informal thing is lacking, of course. Uh, but, well, there's, but, yeah, and a personal interaction matters. I mean, we're having this discussion because I know you because I met you and we spent time together three mm -hmm, years ago. Right. That makes a lot of difference. I think, I, you know, I'm now teaching at Yale as a part. I don't, I think I think it was doing that when I came to see you the last time, I think. Mm -hmm. And the students that I had last fall then had to do distance learning. 
uh, in, in the spring. And I talked to them about how it was and so forth. And they said, well, if you're in a seminar and you know all the people already, because you were, because remember the distance learning started in March, that was halfway through the term. Mm -hmm. So it's not so bad. What's going to happen? I don't think we can do distance learning very well without having any of the people in the class know each other, maybe in a big lecture, but certainly not in a small seminar. So we're not going to, this isn't going to replace human interaction, but I think it can augment it in a way that we couldn't possibly have imagined before we were forced to do it. Yeah, in pedagogy, there, there's this concept of blended learning. I mean, you, you, you meet uh, to practice and rehearse, and at home you, you study yourself, and you, you, you just, just, uh, just connect uh, the, two, the two sides of the, uh, sides I think of the that's coin. Right. I think that's right. Yeah, I can, I, can, I can well imagine that. And you also, um, uh, talking about business and wrapping this all up, you already talked about the, the uh, uh, f in your opinion, like falling, falling real estate prices right. and office spaces uh, being, being, being uh, smaller. Uh, um, uh, so you think that's really changed for good in a year or when? Or will we have another real estate crisis then? What's your assessment on that? Just curious. Uh, whether we have a real estate crisis actually depends more on how much debt the uh, the landlords and the venture capital people take on. I mean, the last crisis we had in 2008 was started by American uh, venture capitalists. It wasn't started because there was a real estate crisis. It was started because they invested in real estate and then did yep. ridiculous things and convinced everybody else to do it. Um, I, w w my own view of this is if you let capitalism work, and I don't consider uh, venture capitalists capitalists because they, you know, they, They gut companies, they take all their assets, they load up a lot of debt, they pay themselves, and then the company's not worth anything. That, I mean, that's not really capitalism. If capitalism works the way Schumpeter talked about it working, um, what, sh what should happen is a lot of these office buildings should be con con uh, converted to residences because there's a shortage of residential housing, um, and it, it, these are already existing buildings. So... You know, if, if capitalism works the way it's supposed to work, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I mean, I, I am a capitalist. I don't believe the government allocation has worked. And I think Eastern Europe and Russia has certainly proved that. Um, but I, I do think that um, capitalism hasn't always worked. It's, it's going through a period now where it's become crony capitalism at the top, even in the democracies. Um, and again, I think Germany, Germany is actually a model for me. I, for example, I'm not afraid of privatization. I believe, as in Germany, that our vocational schools should be run by the business community mm -hmm. because I believe that that is the much, much more likely to get a match between the skills of the workers you want and, the, uh, and the, what the company needs than it is our vocational system, which graduates people that are 10 years behind on the equipment because they can't afford the kind of equipment that, that the companies buy. So the I, I see capitalism as at much more European capitalism as a model where business and, and the government collaborate and labor in the, and the, and the government and the businesses collaborate. We need some of that in the United States. And if that happens, I think capitalism is the only, the only way to go because as, as Schumpeter said, creative destruction uh, is, the, is the most reasonable way of making the kinds of changes that people will normally resist. And that's why socialism didn't work because the government's resisted any kind of risk and any kind of change. And then, of course, the change is going to happen one way or the other. And if it all happens at once, then there's a major problem. One final question, and, and you're all invited for a final round. Um, if you have a question, please ask it now. In 10 seconds, it's too late. Uh, and then I'm going to wrap it up. One final question on that, uh, still on government investment, on government uh, saving strategies at the moment. I'm not talking about the president's crisis management. That's a full, full uh, new topic for, for another discussion. I'm talking about, I mean, the government has, has invested a lot into this crisis management at the, uh, at the moment. Um, a lot has been, been uh, a lot of financial means have been provided. Um, is that something uh, with which you would agree with in principle? Or do you think that a, a democratic president at the moment would have acted differently? Uh, so just, just in, in terms of, of, of stimulating the economy with government money, do you think they did a good job? No, um, I think they stimulated the wrong people. Most of them, a great deal. I mean, Trump himself is probably going to get $200 million out of this in his corporation that he still owns. Uh, the problem is what they, they didn't do is help the small business people. The small business people are still the backbone of, America, of the American economy. 
Uh, and a lot of that money went to big corporations in one form or another. Now, some of that was essential. You can't let Boeing go broke because it's such a huge defense contractor. Uh, but, but, you know, we did a lot of, that money went to a lot of Republican cronies of Mitch McConnell, not ordinary working people. And the ordinary working people are really going to suffer. Uh, it's one of the reasons I think Trump is probably going to lose because um, the economy in the places that voted for Trump is going to be lousy. And there's nothing Trump can do about it. He gave away a huge amount of money. Uh, and the, uh, the vast majority of that did not go to the ordinary people who needed it, except in, in amounts of money that are tiny. Uh, for example, a thousand euros to, you know, to somebody who makes uh, 15, 20,000 euros a, 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 mo a year is not really going to help very much. Um, mm. and, and that's the kind of stuff that they did. So I think a democratic administration would have been much more interested in propping up things like childcare and ordinary workers. Not all of what Trump was did was bad, but the most of the focus of his money went to big companies and his friends, not uh, ordinary working people. Now it's become full circle. We started with criticism of the administration. We are ending with criticism. Governor Dean, thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. I Yeah, I'm, I'm now gonna, gonna do my, my, my final pitch and uh, then I'll close it off. Uh, this concludes today's edition of Transatlantic Voices, Stimmen aus Amerika in Zeiten von Corona. Thank you again for our most distinguished speaker, Governor Howard Dean. Also, thank you to my team, in particular to Katharina, who again was in the background and who managed everything. Thank you to all of you. We've had so many great questions. I'm, I'm really glad that we had you and you enriched our conversation. Now, as you know, we are doing these calls regularly now during this time. Um, we, are, we are skipping next week and the week after uh, the first week of June, we'll have a globalization discussion um, and also a surprise concert. More information will follow shortly. I look forward to staying in touch and be assured we will be back digitally or if time allows again in presence. Until then, be safe, stay healthy. Tschüss and goodbye. Governor, uh, a pleasure talking to you, you and I much. hope to see you again after the crisis. <laughs> Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you. Auf Wiedersehen. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>